before the break, friends, I was uh, talking to you about our true home. And I said that even if you hear all the talks, but if there is no eagerness to go back, if you are not fed up of this, your time is not there. There is a time when we are ready. And these perfect living masters, this term perfect living masters refers to those people I was talking about earlier, who have the awareness of all levels of consciousness at all times. It's not referring to people who have had great experiences and come and tell us about them. Perfect living masters are different from people who have had great experiences. Perfect living masters are one who are aware of their true home while they're sitting with us here. And they want us to be exactly like them. Their goal is not to make us better people. Their goal is not to change our life into something different. Their goal is to make us exactly like themselves. And when they accept a person as a friend, they say, we accept you as a friend, a process they call initiation, or nam, or grant of nam, grant of the ultimate word, of telling you the true word. When such a person, who is a human being like ourselves, but his perfection does not consist in the way he lives, the way he was born, the way he dies, but in the fact that his consciousness and awareness at all times is at full awareness up to the true home, even when he's sitting here in the physical world. He never loses that awareness. Therefore, such a person does not talk to us from memory. Such a person does not talk to us from the scriptures. Such a person does not talk to us from any books. He is talking to us from what is visible in front of him right there. And if he is aware of totality, surely he is very much aware of us. Therefore, when we come across such a person, he plays the role of an ordinary human being. That's where he is. <laughs> The difference between a perfect living master and ourselves is only in consciousness and awareness, nowhere else. He will be exactly like any ordinary person. Sometimes he may be more ordinary than ordinary persons. It is not necessary for him to be anywhere else. He is not going to pull us by showing miracles, by showing tricks, or by showing us something unusual here. He is going to show us the unusual Think about our true home, where we belong, and he will pull us from within with his unconditional love. This unconditional love of a perfect living master is a very rare experience. At least it's for me, it's been a rare experience. That you can love a person, he loves you back, normal. But if you don't love a person, he still loves you. If you hate that person, he still loves you. If you hurt that person, he still loves you. If you kill that person, he still loves you. That's rare. Yeah. And that is exactly what a perfect living master is. Once he accepts us, says, you are my friend, we are friend forever. And there's no compromise on that. Therefore, when he comes and tells us what to do, is he really telling us a way of meditating to go back home? Or is he just appealing to our mind? Because our mind has an ego and says, I have to do something to get anything. Our mind says, nobody gets anything without doing anything. And they can't just sit and say, no, okay, no, I have reached home because I found a perfect living master. Therefore, all the prescriptions he gives, do this, do this, do this, is only for our mind. It's not necessary for our soul. Our soul is seeking its truth. Soul is seeking its origin. Soul is seeking the ultimate true home at all times. The mind comes in the way. The mind is the one that has been used to divert the attention from the soul to external experiences outside. Therefore, we are caught up in these external experiences. So when a perfect living master comes, he pulls the soul. He doesn't care how we look like. He doesn't care what kind of a physical body we have. 
He doesn't care what our karma is. Karma is all mind. He doesn't care where you live, you are poor, rich or what you are. He doesn't care what the color of your skin is. He doesn't care what your age is, your gender is. For him, you are the same. Same soul. A unit of the same totality of consciousness which he is experiencing while he is with in this show here. So that is why his game is not to teach us anything. He doesn't come like a teacher. There are billions of teachers teaching the same thing. Millions of books have been written on meditation and how to do it. He doesn't come to add to these books. He doesn't come to add to these teachings. Teachings are the same. Go within and find the truth. That's the basic teaching. The rest is just to satisfy the mind. No, we have to go in so many steps. Do you know the mind loves? If you tell it, these are five steps to do. If I say take one step, that's not good enough. Ten steps, more advanced course. Take four steps. The mind's function is analytical. It likes to break up things into pieces to understand. Its business is to understand. Its business is not to realize. Its business is not to reach anywhere. Its business is to analyze and understand what is it. In trying to understand, the mind breaks up things into pieces. In system, analysis of everything. Whereas the soul wants unity, oneness, together, synthesis of everything. The exact opposite of analysis. But since the mind is now working for us to create this experience, including the experience of seeing that human being who we call a perfect living master, therefore the perfect living masters come and function like ordinary human beings appealing to our mind and saying, do this, do this. And they prescribe meditation, a method of awakening ourselves so that we can go from one level of awareness to another. That's not their purpose. By the way, there are several masters who can do this. Several masters who can teach us how to get out of body experiences. Several masters who can tell us how to fly in the sky with an astral body. There are some masters, not many, who can also take us to the place of the true causation of this universe, of this creation, and show us the Akashic records, how, how all the destinies are being made up and how we are picking them up ourselves. There are masters like that. But they are not perfect living masters. They are just giving us different experiences. They are not taking us to our true home. Only those who can reveal to us who we really are, the soul, a unit of consciousness with no cover upon it, we would consider as perfect living masters. So the perfect living masters go beyond these levels of physical, astral, causal, they take us to spiritual regions. Their work starts from there. Their work starts from our recognition that we are a soul. The rest are all covers upon ourselves and even the soul is not our reality. A soul is also an illusion. Our reality is our totality from which one unit is being experienced within itself to create the feeling that we are separate, individual. Individualization is the first step in illusion used to create a reality of a soul. To add a mind to it, an accessory, a machine to the soul to create the experience of time and space and events and cause and effect of those events and the law of karma and then to create lifetime after lifetime. That is the next step. It's just an addition to the experience of the soul. Second illusion. To put on sense perceptions to diversify that experience and make seeing and hearing separate, to make touching and smelling separate experiences is the function of another cover we call the astral body that creates the sense perceptions. To make it solid as if this only solidity is the reality, that this is a solid table, my body is solid. I have got a three-dimensional solidity about me. This is therefore real. That's the function of this last cover. When scientists come and tell us that what you think is solid is not really solid. This is all space. Space is emptiness. 
that if you took out all the space from this planet, it will be reduced to a point. When I was a graduate student in physics in the college, a professor of physics told me that this world consists of atoms. They are all atoms put together to create molecules. The molecules create these particles that we see. And every molecule has atoms spread out with space in between and an atom itself with a nucleus with electrons roaming around it, orbiting around it with space in between. That if the space were taken out from all the atoms, this planet of ours would shrink to the size of a football. Very impressive. I came much later, many years later, to Harvard University in this country and I heard a talk by a professor on the nature of space and Einsteinian physics. He said, if all the space is taken out, not only this planet, the whole galaxy will become like a marble. Today, the scientists are saying, if all the space is taken out, all the galaxies put together will become a little point, invisible point. Are we living in that? And we call solidity as the nature of reality of this universe. This is how it has been created externally and internally. On the point of view of physics, we are all living in emptiness, in nothingness. From the point of metaphysics, it's all a creation for the mind that we think this all things are solid. So when you see these things, then you discover that from discovering the soul, you discover the whole thing was created from the power of consciousness. Only when you know who you really are, you discover the power of consciousness. But that is the beginning of the spiritual journey for a perfect living master. He wants to take you from the discovery of an individual soul to your own totality and show you that it's also a sleep state for totality to think you are an individual soul. When I was young, somebody described to me the spiritual journey as the journey of a drop, a drop of water from the ocean, who is somehow traveling far away from the ocean and is living in isolation and wants to go back to the ocean, crying for it. I want to go back to the ocean. And one day with the help of these masters who help the, the drop of water to travel back all the way on the spiritual journey and merge in the ocean. That's our spiritual journey. I applied my mind on it. I said, if I am a drop of any kind of ocean, any kind of water, any kind of consciousness, no matter what, if I am a drop, I have some identity. I am somebody. And they are telling me, undertake a big journey to destroy myself by merger in a big ocean, which will will not be grateful for me at all for coming there. One drop will never make any difference to the ocean. This is a lose-lose situation. I am going to lose myself. Ocean will gain nothing. What the big deal about the spiritual path? It's not worth it. But I was wrong. It took me a lot of many years to understand that although I was a drop of the ocean, drop of consciousness, I never left the ocean. I was a drop of that ocean itself. I was the ocean. I just contracted my awareness to, to a drop. And as I contracted my awareness, I became a big drop. I contracted more small drop, ultimately became a very small drop. But all the time I was ocean. I had lost nothing except awareness. And the reverse is now going to take place. I'll discover I am not a drop, but I am the ocean. Then it made sense. The spiritual path began to make sense. So remember that consciousness, unit of consciousness, which we call the soul, is part of totality. It never left the totality. It's lost the awareness of totality. This is a spiritual path, is a game of getting back to your awareness, full awareness. Every step is an enhancement of your awareness and discovering who you are. Everyone will be an expansion of your awareness 
till you reach totality. Now it makes sense, especially if the awareness is operating through outside means like bodies, like the physical body, it confuses us because then we can't see awareness, we can't see the soul, we can't see consciousness, we can't see life, we only see the body and we identify ourselves. Because we are operating in the body, we identify ourselves with the body. This is myself. A name is given to us, not to us. Name is given to the body. We think it's been a name given to us. Somebody calls by that name, we answer, like him as the self. We are answering as the self to a name that is only used for the body. What happens when we wake up? We discovered we had several bodies with different names. And that was not our name. It was just a name given to the body. Therefore, when we wake up, we discover that we are not the body. We had so many names for different bodies that we have already had and which we are destined to have in the future. It's a chain set up by a very wonderful mechanism. The mechanism is the law of cause and effect, the law of karma. It's a beautiful mechanism, the biggest trap anybody could design. We designed it to have the continuity of experience. How did we design? First create space and time. Then in space and time, place events and connect each event to a cause. One event is a cause, the next event is an effect. Then make the effect a cause of another event and so on and so go on place all these events on a line, timeline and you bring consciousness to one point in the timeline and there you are born. Your life is set, you have previous lives, you never lived them. You never lived your previous lives when you first come. How can you be having previous lives when you are a soul, having no time and space, you just came first time and how can you have previous lives? You require them by the timeline. By the law of karma it is required that you cannot have a life without a past life. So the past life is laid out along with your present life and present life leads to future life. The past life must also have a past life. Therefore, when you come for one life, just for one experience of one life, you live millions of past lives and millions of future lives. If you never lived, never wanted to live, then you have, that's the trap. Because once you start taking this human body as yourself, you get caught up in that cause and effect. And then you get trapped in that. When you escape, you escape from the whole thing. You don't escape only from one life. You escape from the system. That is why this line, this timeline or line, line of different past lives and future lives and present lives is created by the mind and is only sustained by the mind. It is not created by this body. It is not created by your sense perceptions. It is created by that mind to create experience of time and space. When we rise above the mind, it disappears. Soul has no karma. Never had. Never will. Soul doesn't need it. Soul uses a mind to have a different kind of experience called the experience of time and space. And that's why it gets into this. When the soul gets tired, it is pulled out by an arrangement made by the soul itself, made earlier, made before it came here. And that arrangement brings at the right time the contact between another person, equally illusion like this one, equally real like this one, called a perfect living master, whose consciousness is connected with totality and is available to the soul that wants to go back. So, it's a very great arrangement made up by ourselves to go back home and we like to. So, that is when we say we are ready. We can't know we are ready. We could be just fed up of some one problem or some other. Married people are ready every day, you know. <laughs> There's some problem or the other going on. Therefore, we can't say we are ready for the spiritual journey just because we have a dispute or we have an argument. Of course, these arguments 
I am not recommending to you. Lest I be misquoted that in my talk I recommended that you should all have argument because you are married. No. In fact, I want to give you an opposite suggestion to that. Not mine, I am borrowing it from another holy man who came. A holy man came and gave a talk in Chicago. I happened to go and attend it. And a young woman got up and said, Sir, I have a problem. My husband and wife, we argue all the time. We fight over little things. Every time it, it bothers our mind, our ch children can't stand it while we are fighting all the time. Can you give me some kind of a solution to that? And the holy man said, yes, I can give you a solution. You bring a bottle of water and I'll bless it. So the girl goes and brings a bottle of water and the holy man recites some mantra on it. She blesses the water and says, now here, take this water. She says, how often should I give it to my husband? It's not for your husband. It's for you. And now I'll tell you how to use it. When your husband starts speaking, you take a sip of this water. But don't swallow it. Hold it in your mouth. When he stops speaking, swallow it. Supposing he starts speaking again, take another sip. There'll be no dispute. So it's a good way to describe that you can't have an argument with both parties not arguing. But the ego likes to fight. And that is why we perpetuate it. On the spiritual path, we find that we rise above the mind. These things don't affect us. We see them as, as different events planned for a show. It's like an act, like a drama, like a play going on. So the world is like a play. But we don't look at it like that because we are actors who have forgotten we are actors. But we have learned our scripts so well. We have learned them so well that we speak them and act on them automatically. And that's why it looks real. We wanted to create real experiences, so we created reality. Now, when we get out of it as an individual soul, then our spiritual journey starts because that's purely spiritual journey. There's nothing mental about it. There's so many masters who take us to mental which we think universal mind. They can show us all karma was created from there. All destinies were created from there. All life forms were created from there. They can show us that. But they are not perfect living masters because they are still in the cycle of birth and rebirth. And we are still in the cycle of birth and rebirth no matter if we have gone and seen the universal mind. It's only when we have gone beyond the mind and left the system of karma behind then we left the whole game of the mind behind that we can say that's a soul, unit of consciousness. But even the unit of consciousness is a contracted awareness of totality. When the awareness expands from there, which can only happen when in the physical world from where we start this journey, we come across a person, a perfect living master who is operating when he meets us when he sees us, when he talks to us from totality. And such a person is very rare. If we have so many seekers, why should that person be rare? We should have lots of them to meet the needs of seekers. The truth is there are very few seekers of the true home. Many of us go to masters and say, Master, I am sick. Can you give me some healing? Master, can you help me? Give me the lottery numbers. I just want some more extra money. Most of the time, we are asking for things of this very world. Sometimes we are asking for some heavens, some more pleasurable experiences in meditation. Those are also all astral experiences. When we worship God, who we say God sits in the heaven, we are worshipping just the controller, the regulator of the astral plane. Because we are placing God on a throne, sitting up in a big heaven. Don't you see that's just time and space? There's not much difference between here and there. We have a president of a country, we have a king of a kingdom, and we have a God sitting in the running a universe. And if we pray that and say that's God, that's our totality, we can go. And then we go higher, we find that there is a way to go higher than that. What about God? 
we leave him behind? No, we find that the God who runs this whom we worship is also so like ourselves. It is just his good karma that he could occupy that position. And several times their souls have occupied that position and come back, even as ants. The Krishna tells Arjun, tell Udo, actually as a childhood friend, that this little ant crawling here, law of karma is so subtle, this ant crawling here was well, Brahma, the creator of this universe. But by his karma, he become an ant. Even by reaching that highest level, so long as the level is within the realm of the mind, you are not out of the game, out of this big trap that we got into. We have made arrangements to get out. When we are ready to go beyond this, when our desires and wishes and seeking is for something beyond this, then only such a perfect living master comes into our life. And that's not so common, that's rare. Therefore, the masters are rare. But they do come whenever we are ready. Supposing we are ready halfway, we are not fully ready. We think, this is bad, we want something better. We'll find a master who will take us something better. And if our seeking stops there, that will be our goal, destination, that's the end. We'll enjoy that and come back again. Supposing we want more, another master will appear in our life and take us more. Only when we seek our true home, ultimate true home, and none of the things of the mind, no desires of the mind are left. Only the seeking of our true home is left. And finally, a perfect living master comes into our life. But this does not mean that we should be searching for a perfect living master. Because if we are searching for a master who is totally like ourselves, how are we going to find him? If you are different, yes, we could find him. But why would he be different? If he is carrying totality of consciousness with him as a human being, why would he be different from us? He'll be exactly like us. And therefore, we can't find him. We can find other masters who say, I can take you there. I am so and so. I can take you there. All right. We'll follow. He'll take us there. Perfect living masters will live with us like their friends. They will pull us not by showing their awareness, not by showing their knowledge, not by showing their learned learnings, but by the power of their love, the power that comes right from our true home. It is that power of unconditional love that they use exclusively. But then, because our mind wants to be taught, even though they picked up the right soul, ready to go home, and we know we are ready to go home, the mind is saying, why don't we learn something to go home? They say, okay, we'll become a teacher also for you. They teach meditation. So meditation is a means to reach a point where no meditation is needed. Meditation is not an end by itself. Meditation is used just to develop that which we call love and devotion. That is why when I have meditation sessions and people say we have been meditating for 40 years, 50 years and repeating words and doing this, I say, how can repetition of physical words ever take you anywhere? They are physical words. No matter what mantra it is, no matter what simran it is, they are spoken physical words. They can't take you very far. In fact, they end at the astral plane. There are no words after that at all. And we think these words are going to take us to true home. No repetition of any mantra has ever taken anybody beyond the astral plane. But then when we start thinking the regulator of the astral plane is God, then we become God-realized. But we are still bound by the same rules. But when we are looking for the truth beyond that, words finish on the way. Sounds which last longer because there is a sound, the resonance of the, of the soul itself. Consciousness itself has a resonance which can be heard if you put your attention on yourself. That resonance lasts longer than the words. In fact, if the resonance of yourself can be heard by you in meditation and you have sufficiently withdrawn your awareness from the body, you should leave the words and go only after the resonance. It will take you higher than the words can. But resonance is its own limit. When the resonance cannot be heard, you have to go by love and devotion. Ultimate, ultimate name of the game is love and devotion. Without that, nothing can go.
फेमस सेंट पल्टू से साहिब के दरबार में केवल भक्त प्यार In the court of that Lord, nothing counts except love and devotion. Everything else falls down below on the way. But I am t- telling you all these things, and does it look easy? Does it? And many of you have tried this. It's pretty hard. I know it was hard for me. It must be hard for you. We try to meditate, even the simplest of things. Repeating the words is so difficult. we try to repeat within a few minutes we're thinking of something else then we try to bring the words back and fight ourselves no you are supposed to be repeating those words not thinking of other things at this at this meditation time so we start thinking of the words and thoughts goes away somewhere else and we fight we fight with the mind bring the words back and again the words disappear and so some other thoughts come we sit for hours it looks like hours it's actually 15 minutes <laughs> but it looks like we sat for hours and we are so tired and exhausted like we lost the battle what an experience of meditation who will meditate if this is the way to meditate who will like to meditate if such a exhausting experience is called meditation none of us will have the patience to do it that is why people give up people get initiated when they try to do meditation it's so hard they give up therefore i should share a secret to you an alternative to meditation how about that a simple easy alternative to meditation but which should work very similar to it if you find meditation difficult then do seva service is a big word s e v e r we write like that seva service do service donate your time to service if you cannot donate your time to meditation serve your master serve people close to your master you can't find them serve anybody one condition if it is a service it is not paid service it is not compensated service if you are expecting a reward for service that doesn't count it should be service without expecting a reward a service as an offering offering to the master master you gave me method, many methods of coming and appreciating your love and devotion they did work for me but i'm going to try this method of service now okay i'll perform service and i perform every kind of service as a substitute for meditation let me see if it works service is an offering without expecting a reward in the bhagavad gita krishna calls it the karma yogi performing his karma without expecting a reward without expecting any fruits thereof and then only it become the yog yogic practice you are giving your time service can be of many kinds it's not only time you can do service with money which is also money service you give money to somebody but if you say now i given this money it's an investment what will i get that's not service you give it and it's given without expecting anything it's service there can be service of physical labor you can work for somebody volunteer to do something without expecting anything it is service so there can be service with material things there can be service with your body and then there can be service with your mind what is service with the mind service with the mind is to meditate without expecting any reward as an offering you say today's session i am going to put my 2 hours and i'll only watch you master and i offer it to your service not because i'm expecting to go into higher levels or anything today no say service if you can give service with the material things with your labor with your time with your meditation believe me the result will be the same as good meditation that's a big thing a big alternative 
If you find withdrawal of attention through meditation is difficult, try this alternative. And it works. How come this, how come this simpler way, an external way of doing things can work like something that was withdrawal of attention inside? The secret is that when you are going to give service without expecting a reward, it's an act of surrender of the mind. The surrender of the mind is actually high degree of meditation. If you can surrender your mind, then you have surrendered something which is the most important thing for you, which you use all the time. So when you are saying, I'm not expecting a reward, because the mind does not want to do anything without expecting some reward. So you are reversing the very course of the mind. Although it looks like simple that you are doing something externally, you are actually affecting the mind and drawing your attention to where it belongs. And you will see the results coming up. Now, when you do service or seva, it can be any kind of voluntary service. Masters are human beings. We come and serve them. Sometimes it is very simple service. I was a very young boy, this high, maybe seven, eight years old. And I wanted to do service for great master, Nadul Maharaj Baba Saban Singh, my master. And all I could think of was that there was people standing behind him fanning him. The fan was so big. I asked master if I can fan him. He said yes. Others told, Master, he is too small to hold a big fan. He said, no, give him the fan. So I still remember, after so many years, after 80 years and more, I am remembering holding that fan. And the joy it gave me has not left me till today. It was just physical service. Today, I am giving a talk here. You might think I am trying to help you with something. No. Oh. I am doing service to my master, only selfishly for myself. It's the same service. It's a service which I expect no reward except the joy and bliss I get out of it. Every service gives that. It doesn't matter. I helped. Master said, can we build a road to from the railroad station up to where we live? I was I had some contacts with government engineers and with the other people. I worked, got the road built. I felt the same bliss. It doesn't matter what it is. It's not that a particular service is better than the other service. All service is the same. It depends on how you do it and it's an offering. No expectation of reward. The reward is the bliss that comes automatically without your expecting it. That is why Service is important. So many people sometimes want to be volunteering for service. I like that people should volunteer for service. After giving this tip that this is such a good equivalent for meditation, a lot of people would like to do that. And we try to find other ways of providing service. When we have a larger gathering, we need to regulate the gathering. We need to find places so many people volunteer to be sevagars people offering service. There, I have one word of caution. When you are doing service, forget everything else except that you are doing service for the master. Even if you are, if you are not a believer in a master, this service for God, service for the soul, service for spirituality, but not for what you will get from there. And one thing that needs to be taken care of, when you don't expect a reward, and service for the master brings the love of the master into you. And the ego gets back because you are thinking of the master all the time while doing it. But if the ego is strong, and you think you have gone into a position of authority, if you think you have come from sudden ordinary people to police officers, to policing the place, that is not service. I have noticed that sometimes this happens. That just by being given an opportunity to do service, which is a great humbling experience, instead of acting like a humble person, we begin to show off, we have some authority over you. Uh, that is not service. If it is not service, 
that if you give it an opportunity to voluntarily help in something, to make it into a, 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 an exercise of authority. So whoever gets a chance to do this, I would remind them, please be as humble. Think this is a great opportunity given by the master to do something for somebody. Who represents the master? Every person that you serve, no matter who. For you, is representing the master. You are not doing it for that person, you are doing it for the master. Therefore, the maximum humility and kindness should be shown if you are given a position where you have to do some regulation. And regulation is necessary whenever we have these. Logistically necessary. And people are getting an opportunity in the service. So just be careful, watch out. And this opportunity doesn't go into your head and make you feel, oh, I'm superior to others or I'm different from others. So use utmost kindness when you get an opportunity to serve. And take it like remembering it. I am doing it because my ego failed to meditate properly. I am using it as a substitute for that. And the master has given me this alternative opportunity and it works. So these were points I wanted to make so that people who get into that position take good advantage of this. But the alternative works. And those who find it difficulty, meditation to service. After service, what do you do? Meditate again. And meditation will be easier. You can try it. The more you live a life of humility, the more your meditation succeeds. Because it's a game of putting the ego in its right place. The right place for the ego is in the back of your head, not in the front. When you push your ego to the back of your head and the soul, the spirit of your consciousness in front, you do very well. Now some people tell me, what you are really saying is that this world is our attachment and therefore we should detach ourselves and just go about our spiritual path to find our true home. Are you telling us we should not fulfill our responsibilities in life? We have children to take care of. We have jobs to do. We have so much work to do given to us as our responsibility by the very fact of where we are born and what we are growing and what we are happening around us. We have responsibilities all over us. You might explain them away, the karmic responsibilities, but they are still responsibilities. Can we shy away from these responsibilities and run away from them? The spiritual answer is no. If you run away from responsibility, the responsibility chases you and will not leave you. If you run away from an attachment, the attachment chases you. Whatever you are attached to, if you try to run away from it, it follows you. People think that by running away from the world, going into mountaintops, going into retreats in the, in the forest, they will make great progress. Their mind is being drawn to the cities. They are drawn to the same attachments all the time while they are far away. Therefore, running away from responsibility is no good on the spiritual path. You should fulfill your responsibility to the full, but with a little change. And the change is, instead of saying, I am doing this, which is egoistic, throw the burden of this I on a more powerful being who has come into your life, the master. Say, master is doing it. Let master handle it. Let him handle it. He promised to handle everything. Let's watch. You become a spectator to your own actions of responsibility and see it happen. It works. This little trick that you can play that instead of saying I am doing it, to put in someone else to do it. And someone else who is totality of consciousness. It is like saying I leave everything to God. And now God is doing everything. I am merely watching what he is doing. Actually you are still doing the same thing. And doing better than before. So one does not shun from responsibility just because you say you are on a spiritual path. But you shift the onus of responsibility on a higher power than yourself. Therefore, 
when the mind steps in to say, you have to make a decision anyway. You can't leave that to God. Today you have a choice to make. Should I do this or do that? That's part of your responsibility. Are you going to wait for your master to come? Are you going to wait for God to come and tell you what to do? Or are you going to use your mental decision making to say what is to be done? These issues come up in our life every day. How do we handle them? Do we go at that time with our mind's will or God's will? A confront this is a confrontation that the mind feels. For those who believe in God, those who believe in a master, those who believe in a superpower, those who believe there is a power that exists, and they say, should I follow that power or should I follow my mind? The instruction is, don't follow your mind. I have to make a decision. How do I do it? This question was put to a great mystic, Rumi, Maulana Rumi, Jalaluddin Rumi, and he answered it. He says, people want to know, how do we know what is God's will? Isn't everything God's will? Even what our mind thinks is also God's will? Then how can we differentiate between one will or another? Has he created two wills? Yes, God has created for our experience two wills. The mind's will and the spiritual will. The mental will and the spiritual will. The will of the ego and God's will. Then how do we know what is God's will? He says very simple. If he puts a spade in your hand, he has expressed his will. Dig. If he has put a pen in your hand, he has expressed his will. Right. If he has placed circumstances in your life which tell you what to do, do it. That follow the circumstances that are arising around you, giving you a clue to what you should be done. If you can't understand the circumstances, they are themselves divided, then have a backup of those circumstances called intuition. Intuition has been placed inside us. Coincidences outside. They always match. The intuition says something. I should do this today. I didn't think about it. It just came. That's the difference between intuition and reason. In reason, you think and come to a conclusion. In intuition, it comes suddenly. It's called gut feeling. Inner feeling. It just comes. When you get that gut feeling, and then you mind begin to question, that doesn't look sensible. I know you feel like it, but not sensible. It doesn't make sense. Then you're driving on the road, and you're holding unrelated to your intuition as a few words and match that. Say, how could this coincidence happen? How did these two things happen together? These function like that. And let me tell you, when you have spiritual experiences, the number of intuitive cut feelings will increase. And so will the coincidences outside. In every person that I have come who is on the spiritual path, when he's taken seriously, both these things increase in number. Giving great, great guidance to us. How to make decisions when in conflict, what, what to do. Supposing we haven't reached that point where this gut feeling comes. But gut feeling, please remember, is not thinking about something as calling a gut feeling. A, a friend of mine once came, he said, I'm developing the art of getting intuitive experiences. So how do you develop that? I'll give me an example. He said, I'm going to give you an example of my intuition working now. I have to decide whether I should leave tomorrow morning or day after tomorrow morning. Now, I don't want reason to play any role in this. I'll use my intuition to tell me, should I leave tomorrow or day after? I said, let's see how you use it. And he said, uh, tomorrow. I said, tomorrow was all right, but what was that uh, before that? <laughs> Therefore, your mind operating to take a decision. In intuition, there is no time at all. When the gut feeling comes, it comes so suddenly. And nothing to do with the reason. In fact, very often, it will be against what your reason is saying. And that is why, when we say that you follow intuition, these come rarely, but they come more frequently if you are on the spiritual path. Coincidences are what are they? What are external coincidences that match up with them? These are merely events happening against the law of probability. They're not probable it should happen, but it happens. And these two match and give you a guidance. Supposing you haven't reached that point at all in your life. Another simple rule of thumb. A simple rule of thumb is 
if I have to make a decision between two options, which one will take me closer to my master, to my spiritual journey, which one will take me away? Pick up the one that takes you closer. That's a rule of thumb, works very well also. Till you reach that point, when the intuition and consciences match, this rule of thumb will also operate. I am sharing these things with you, not because I want to teach you anything new. I am sharing these things because I have gone through this process of doubts, process of skepticism. I have gone through these questionings for myself. At my age, I am not looking forward to something, but I can look back on what happened. In November 1989, I had plenty of time to look at human life, to be look at experiences. From these experiences, I'm sharing these things to give you a jump start in your own spiritual journeys. So because some of these things come again and again, I'm just sharing some experiences so that they will be helpful to you. I hope that your spiritual journey will succeed. And I'm very happy that you all came and I could share these experiences with you. And uh, I have to go for my knee surgery, total knee replacement uh, next month and uh, so I'll be little out of commission for a while so there may be no meeting the next couple of months so but in December we'll meet again so I'll be very happy to see you again thank you very much for joining me I would like to answer a few questions if they are still with Charlton how does the dying while living experience compare to the experience of Samadhi is it the same as Navikalpa, Savikalpa, or Sahaj Samadhi, or is it completely different? How does the experience of dying while living compare to the experience of Samadhi? It's the same as Navikalpa, Savikalpa, or Sahaj Samadhi, or completely different? Samadhi is a state of becoming unaware of our body. And it's several types of samadhis that you can have. You are only mentioning the names of different types of samadhis. Samadhi is a practice by which you can become unaware of the body, not necessarily going into a higher level of awareness. People who do meditation on the six centers of energy below them, which are energy centers, and they are all below our eye level they go to Samadhi at different levels. Many of them go to Samadhi at the heart level, heart chakra. Some go into the Kundalini section, which is even lower, the reversal of energy at the genital level, from the spine to the genital, there's a reversal because that when you experience the body in energy centers, you'll find that there's these different energy centers are really circuits of energy from where a lot of things are happening, maintaining our body and maintaining our experiences, physical experiences. It's like these are different floors of a house. So you can go on the stairs up and down. The spine functions like an elevator and people can put their attention on the spine. So people have practice of different kinds of samadhis based upon use of their attention along the spine or along various centers in front. When you have these samadhis, you can have out-of-body experiences. You know the best samadhi we all do and all have every day is called sleeping. We sleep every night, we are unaware of our body. We go into samadhi. But that samadhi is at the throat center. Every time when we go to sleep at night, we are withdrawing our attention from the physical body. It is automatic. Automatically, we withdraw attention, it drops down. And when it drops down below the nose, we are not sure where we are. And by the time we go to throat, we are having dreams. And we can also go further down and forget all our dreams when we wake up. It's a natural samadhi we all go through every night. That the focal point of wakeful consciousness is behind the eyes at the third eye center. They call it third eye because it's between these eyes and that's the one that really sees. These are mere organs. But the seeing eye is the third eye, even now. So the third eye center is the center that divides 
the energy centers from the spiritual centers, the centers of awareness. Energy and awareness are not the same thing. Energy can be experienced of many kinds below the eyes. Awareness can be experienced behind and above the eyes. They're two different things. So we go to samadhis of various kinds. Those samadhis, whether natural samadhi or induced by concentration of attention on any of these energy centers, gives us a different kind of experience. The samadhi that takes you to higher wakefulness, which is withdrawal of attention from the two eyes and behind the eyes into the portion of the consciousness that is called the four petal lotus, which is equivalent of going down into these centers. Then we move backwards and in the center and then move upwards in the head. These are also points like centers. These are centers of energy. Those are centers, 12 centers of awareness. The number of centers of awareness is much larger. Very few people exploit them. Very few people even touch them. Because that requires deeper and deeper pulling of awareness in the whole body. So the samadhis that have been talked of at different times are different samadhis. It all depends whether you are using the energy centers for the samadhi, using withdrawal. If you are using the withdrawal of your attention to become unaware of the body, and that's what I call dying while living, you are performing a samadhi of awareness. If you are putting your attention on the heart center to get an out-of-body experience, that's a samadhi of energy. So that's the big difference. What are the parameters for trusting inner experiences? How can one know the authenticity of what we are experiencing as truth or a mental happening or falsehood? What are the parameters for trusting inner experiences? How can we know the authenticity of what one experiences or truth of a, of a mental happening or false? or falsehood. Very interesting question. When we go to sleep, we wake up in the morning. What is the proof that you are awake? What is the authenticity that you are awake? Have you ever tested it out? Has anybody, when you wake up in the morning, say, am I awake or not? Can I trust I am awake? Supposing 20 people come around you when you wake up in the morning, and say, you are still sleeping. Do you believe those 20 or you believe your experience of wakefulness? You would not believe even a thousand people come. Wakefulness is an experience by itself carrying its authenticity. It's a change of level from one that was less to something that is more. It is a revelation of your own self. So when you have an experience of true wakefulness, it carries its own authenticity. It is just like saying, how can you be sure you are there? You say, I know because I know, I know it is it's there. I am there. I exist. Nobody can deny I exist. Will you please check it up? Please authenticate that you exist? No, that's a self-evident existence. The proof of some experiences lies in the experience itself. One of the greatest experiences is the proof lies in the experience, is the experience of wakefulness. Let me explain. When we wake up in the morning, how are we sure we have woken up? Ever examined this? I don't think anybody thinks about it. You are still lying in bed. Eyes are closed. No movement of your hands. No movement of your body. You know you are awake. What happened? You haven't tested out. You haven't opened your eyes. You haven't pinched yourself to see if I am awake. Nobody does that. What has given you that sudden feeling? from a sleep state into a wakeful state. The real secret is that you remember that you slept. You remember that you are in the same bed where you slept. The memory of going to sleep connects you immediately to the, memory, to the experience of wakefulness. When you have a true awakening to a higher level of consciousness, the memory kicks in. You are there way before you were physically alive. And that carries its own authentication and own proof. So there are experiences which carry their own authenticity. 
But if experiences are not of total wakefulness, you just see beautiful scenes inside, you see waterfalls, colors, lights. Some people say, I saw some lights inside, I must be in a higher heaven or something. That's not authenticated experience. I can hit somebody on the head and he'll see the same stars and the same light. I mean, you can't call that. Just because you've seen some light inside, you've seen some stars blinking, that you've gone somewhere. You do get these experiences. They are very nice, but they are not wakefulness. When you awake to the astral plane, you connect yourself when you were in the astral plane before you were ever in the human body, in the physical body. And that carries real authenticity. Please explain the essence of drishti. Explain the essence of drishti. These are two terms we use. Darshan and drishti. Darshan is the opportunity to be able to look at the face of an enlightened person. A person carrying higher consciousness reflects that consciousness in his eyes, in his face and looking at him impacts us. Sometimes the impact is obvious. We feel it. Sometimes it's more subtle because we are not seeing what is actually being shown. We are seeing only a human face. So the impact can differ. But by seeing the face of an enlightened person and then depending upon how enlightened he is, when you see the face of a perfect living master, even once you are guaranteed to be a seeker. That means you are going to go back to your true home. According to some scriptures I read, it said that your account in this world ends when you have seen the face of a perfect living master. You see the face of a son, Sadhguru, at the end of their account, the rest is only a follow up, takes no more than a few lives at the most. That is why that is called darshan, to be able to see the face of an enlightened person. A story is told of Narad Muni. Narad was a Muni. Munis are certain ranks of yogis. They have reached a little higher status than ordinary karm yogis. And they have access to their isht, isht to be the god they worship. Narad Muni worshipped Brahma, the god of creation. So he would in his meditation talk to the god, to Brahma, and get all his guidance from him. Narad Muni used to travel from place to place, village to village, and people respected him for his enlightenment and took care of him, gave him arms, gave him lodging, gave him accommodation to stay and get food, eat. So he would tell them about enlightenment and tell them about various. He also told, he's a good storyteller. Sometimes he would tell stories about people and the neighbors, the neighbors are bad and you are good or something. So some people think Narad Muni was also a clever guy who was also creating gossip. Whatever the stories are, Narad Muni had some access to some ist inside whom we call Brahma. One day Narad Muni is walking and he sees hundreds of people running. And he says, where are you running? And they said, a Satguru has come, a master has come, and we are going to have his darshan. He said, what? What is the darshan of a human being who is running? Not darshan of God inside? No, no, we are having darshan of that guru. He said, this is very silly. That I spent all my life trying to find God and have his darshan inside. These people running outside to have, look at a man and calling it darshan. He said, I must get an answer to this question. So he meditated. And he manifested Brahma, his ish. And he said, Brahmaji, I would like to know why these people are running to see somebody, see the face of a person, and they call it darshan. And Brahma said, Oh, they are running like that. I'll tell you how to get the answer to this question. You go to a certain village and there's a pond there. In the pond, there is a snake. You go and ask that snake and he'll give you the answer. So Narad Muni goes, Brahma's instructions, goes to that village, sees a pond and there's a snake with his head up like this in the water. So Narad Muni says, Mr. Snake, just translating it uh, in a little colloquial English. 
He never said Mr. But anyway. He said, Mr. Snake, what is the benefit of having darshan of a guru? And the snake looked at him, dropped his head and died. Never got the answer. So he went back to Brahma. He said, Brahma ji, what is this going on? You sent me to the snake. I asked him the question, what is the benefit of having darshan of a guru? The snake died. Brahma ji said, oh, I am sorry to hear that. Okay, I'll tell you. Now you go to another village far off. And there is a jeweler. In his house, there is a parrot. A parrot in a cage. You go and ask this question from the parrot. He'll give you an answer. So Narad Muni, following his instructions, went to that village and asked if there is a jeweler living here. They said, yes. He has, has he got a parrot? Yeah, he got a new parrot. So he went to the house. He said, Mr. Jeweler, can I have a little talk with your parrot that you got? <laughs> Certainly, lucky parrot that Narad Muni should come to talk to him. So he goes to the parrot. He says, Mr. Parrot, what is the benefit of having darshan of a guru? The parrot looked at Narad Muni, dropped his head and died. He said, this is very funny. I went back to Brahma. He said, Brahma ji, what is going on? You send me to the snake and the snake dies without answering. Now you send me to a parrot, the parrot has died. When will I get the answer? Oh, both died, sorry. Now you go to travel to a large king, kingdom of some king. The queen is giving birth to a baby boy there. You reach there and ask that little child, that little infant who is being born, and he'll give you an answer. Now snake and parrot were all right. Now you're talking of a human being. A little baby. Anyway, he had to carry out the instructions of Brahmaji. So he travels for months and months and reaches that kingdom. And there he is received by the king. Oh, very well, lucky you come so all the way back to see us. I have come to see a little baby. Has the queen given birth to a baby boy? Yes, of course. Can I have his little conversation with him? Can I meet him? Sure, lucky baby to see you. Narad Muni here. I want to meet him in private. Nobody should be there. Okay, you just go in and meet the baby. So he went to the infant, to the baby, and said, Mr. Baby, what is the benefit of having the darshan of a guru? And the infant spoke. He said, Narad Muni, I am the same parrot that you saw in the cage. I am the same snake that you saw in the pond. You are not a Sadguru, you are just a Muni. But just having your darshan pulled me up from one kind of level of life to another life, instantly cutting off my karma and brought me back to human life. When you have a darshan of a perfect guru, the benefit is thousand times more. That is how Narad Muni got the answer. There is a great benefit. Just looking. Now that is darshan. Now comes something even more useful than darshan. is drishti. Drishti is not when you look at a guru, drishti is when the guru looks at you. When he gives you attention with his eyes, he is giving you even much more than a darshan can give you. So the benefit of these things is realized when suddenly the seeking in you starts from these points. When suddenly you find that you have been chosen. Somebody said, you sometimes talk of marked sheep, that there are marked souls that these masters come for those marked souls. When does the marking take place? That's a good question. When does the marking take place? Now, if I say, if I give them the correct answer, the marking takes place in our true home, where there is no time and no space. Is it then now? Is it everlasting now? The answer would be correct. When there is no time, it's an everlasting now. That means marking is taking place now or way back when we came here. There is no difference from there. Difference is from here. If you are really going to a perfect living master, when are you being marked? If you are the chosen one, like they say, many are called, but few are chosen. Many come and meet these perfect masters, but few are marked. Who are these marked souls? They say, you are not chosen because you are marked. 
you are marked because you are chosen. A drishti marks you. That's a very big thing. And a drishti can make you a marked soul from what time? From inception, from the very beginning. That means you are marked from the beginning. Experience is taking place here in the physical world. And you are just getting drishti of a human being. A human being looking at you. But it's a human being who's in touch with eternity. Human being is in touch with, with your true home. With totality of consciousness. Then he looks at you, you're marked. But you've been marked ever since. After that, what happens? After this thing, you've been marked. Then you can be marked in category A, category B. List A, list B. List A means that you have come at that stage in your life. You come at that stage of your karmic pattern that you have to go back, right back in this very life. No more coming here into physical world. No more coming into the world where you create a new karma. Or you can be marked for this to be that you are not ready for that as yet. But in the next few lives you can hope. And then there will be somebody else who will be a human being and will be a perfect living master at that time who will take you back. He will be your perfect master, you'll be in his list A. So when these masters come, they are continuously marking people, A and B, and A they take back, same life. There is a verse in a poem attributed to Swamiji of Agra. Swami Seth Sivdhyal Singh, who was the founder of the group called Radha Swami. So the Radha Swami group Swamiji says that you cannot have more than four lives if you are accepted by the master. Even acceptance or drishti of a master guarantees that you will be having no more than four lives. So he describes the four lives. Like this I tell you in Hindi, as recorded in the poem, they translated for you. Ek janam gur bhakti, janam dusre naam, Janma Tisre Turiyapad Chothe Me Nijdaan Then you have four lives. First life to develop your love and devotion for a master. Second life to get initiation from a perfect living master. Third life to reach the level of consciousness at the universal mind or Turiyapad. Fourth life to home. He described it like that. An incident happened with my father who was a follower of the same master which was actually an advantage for me and also a disadvantage that he was my father. The advantage was I was able to meet my master when I was very small because I was born. The disadvantage was that I was influenced by the fact that just being born with him and following a certain pattern never got a chance to explore other methods. So I remained a skeptic for many years just for that reason. So there was an advantage and disadvantage. My father, the great follower of great master, he heard one day the great master quoting these four lines about the four lives. And he said, a person initiated by a perfect living master cannot have more than four lives in this human birth. And each birth will be better than the previous one. He missed that satsang, that discourse. The evening he met the great master and he said, Master, is that true? That today you announced that a person initiated by you or by any perfect living master will not have more than four lives. The great master told my father, Lekhraj, why are you worried? This is your last life. Why are you asking this question? Lekhraj was my father's name. Why are you concerned? This is your last life. He said, Master, I was asking, supposing I want a fifth one, am I barred from it? I want to come five times and you are saying you can't have more than four. So it was a laughed out thing. Then the great master explained, when we talk of four lives, it does not mean everybody has to go through four lives. If a master initiates a person and the disciple follows those instructions, this is his last life. Done with. If a person cannot follow those instructions or dilly dallies about it and says, okay, I will do it later, then he can get a second life. Only when a person completely leaves the path and says this was no good and goes away to something else, he comes with third life. 
only when a person turns into hatred for that master, even kills him, crucifies him, he has to come in the fourth life. He explained, don't think it's fourth life for everybody. If you follow the instructions, this is your last life. You don't have to come again. So don't take this, this fourth life principle. I came to this country in the 60s, first time. And I used to meet co-travelers, fellows of Sanghis. And they would say, okay, we'll be here four lives. <clears throat> All of them telling me they are going to be here four lives. Well, how do you know this is not your fourth life? How do you know? Do you remember your past life that you spent waiting and this is your last life? No, but we heard there are four lives. So that's why we think we are all going to be at four lives. Not necessarily. If you are following the instruction, this is your last life. And how do you know this? May, you may have done so much work. I can tell you I meet people who from the childhood have a get seeking in them. Where did that come from? Work done in past lives. You can't be suddenly seeking. I have met families in which non-believers are the whole family except one child comes up and is a believer and is seeking and does not conform to any other family values. Where did that come from? Past life is already done. It doesn't mean that this is our first life and we have to come for four lives. In any case, my recommendation to is follow the instructions, make it your last life. You have a series about going back to true home. Thank you very much for joining me.